Hello, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Anna Rule. I'm the representative of the Aga Khan Development Network at COP27, where we're an observer organization and also the general manager of the Aga Khan Agency for Habitat. We're very excited to be here today. First of all, because the Aga Khan Development Network believes we should not give up on one and a half degrees. In fact, we should work harder. And there's many reasons for that, but, and we ourselves will do our bit by committing to having already committed and implementing a net zero target by 2030 across the entire network, including industries and commercial enterprises. But a very important thing we want to focus on today is adaptation, a big theme at this COP. And why do we want to focus on it? For two reasons. First of all, because even if we make one and a half degrees, there's already so much adaptation that is necessary today because many people are already in trouble in their habitats. And of course, adaptation gets more difficult as the temperature runs ahead of us. So we need to figure out ways in which we learn to adapt so that we can live with whatever the result of the climate change negotiations is because we are not giving up on mankind on the planet. And we want therefore to, in the cryosphere pavilion, and we're very grateful that the cryosphere pavilion is having us, focus on a specific issue, which is how do you allow people to continue to live and do well who live right at the front line of climate change in the mountains. There are many hazards there. The specific hazard we'll focus on today is avalanches because we've made a lot of progress. We're doing a lot of work and because it's a terrible hazard and it is not a hazard for people who go skiing just like that in Aspen or Davos. It's a hazard for people whose very house is at risk. We'll start with a quick video to introduce and then we'll go straight to Doug Chabot, who is leading our avalanche work all the way from Bozeman, Montana. But our work is in Central and South Asia, as he will explain. Doug, uh, the film is rolling. Thank you. So Doug, we'll go straight over to you. Doug is in Bozeman, Montana. Thank you so much, Arno. And I also, I want to really want to thank everyone at uh, COP27 showing up for this and also for, for hosting us. Uh, today, we're going to talk about mitigating avalanche risk in high mountain Asia. In specific, we're going to talk about the community-led and data-driven approaches we take to uh, mitigate that risk. Now, here on this map, uh, the Aga Khan Agency for Habitat, which we'll refer to as Aga throughout the presentation, uh, creates habitats that allow communities to be resilient to disasters, adapt to climate change, and thrive. Uh, the red box is where Aga's avalanche program is concentrated. It's in the largest mountain ranges in the world. We've got um, in northern Pakistan, the Karakoram, in northern Afghanistan, the Hindu Kush, and in southern Tajikistan, the Premiers. 
Now, when we look at a timeline, uh, in 2012 is when this program really kind of started. And that's when there was a historic avalanche cycle. About 148 people lost their lives, uh, mostly in Tajikistan. Uh, in 2014, avalanches in Parabir and Nurs in northern Afghanistan killed 31 people. And then in uh, 2015, His Highness the Aga Khan creates the Aga Khan Agency for Habitat. Now in 2016, we put up 89 weather monitoring posts. And these weather monitoring posts are manual weather stations, and we'll describe those a little bit later. And then 2017, it was quite a big year because this is considered the watershed year that separates our pre-program and post-program periods for analysis uh, and discussion. And so we built this database where all this weather information is going online, uh, and then we develop the Winter Preparedness and Avalanche Readiness Program, which encompasses everything we're talking about today. We launched that. And then in 2018, we're weekly weather and avalanche forecasts we're putting out uh, to warn and inform villagers. Now, in 2014, um, I wrote an avalanche manual, and it helped AKDN introduce avalanche education to the village level. And this manual was translated uh, into Dari and Urdu. And Anna, I'm gonna hand this back to you. Uh, Anna's the general manager of Alaka, and he's gonna talk about uh, the approach we're taking. So I'd like to just overall explain what we're trying to do at Alaka, because we don't just work on avalanches. Our logic is that um, in order to have communities do with the onset of climate change and the fact that this gets worse and worse because that's the reality we deal with we need to do two three things first we need to plan we need to understand the risk in a scientific way and understand as best as possible what is the risk where is the risk specifically in a community which house school health center piece of infrastructure etc based on that we can prepare the communities by discussing with them what are the issues where is the risk? Is your risk? Is your at risk? And if so, what do you do? Is it for a mudslide or is it for an avalanche? And organize the communities with volunteers, as Doug and Shortmon will again. Uh, Shortmon, by the way, is our global head of emergency management and uh, monitoring and evaluation, and he will uh, speak uh, very soon. Prepare the community. Now, the big space that we don't just want communities who live at the edge of climate change to survive. We actually want their children to do well in their future and not by moving to the city. Doing well born. Because why should a daughter of a family born in the high mountains in Central Asia not have the same future as somebody who gets born in the city? It is not the right perspective on how we want to address the problem. Where do we do this? We do this in South and Central Asia, specifically Pakistan, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, in India, but that's more coastal, as well as in Syria, where the regions are more arid. Why do we work in these countries? First of all, because they're the historic parts of engagement of the Aga Khan Development Network, but very importantly, because these are some of the toughest places in the world in terms of the impact of climate change, in particular, of course, in the mountains. And we believe that if we can show that even in the Karakoram, even in the Pamir Mountains, even in the Hindu Kush, these are some of the toughest mountains in the world. Even there, people can adapt to climate change. Maybe the, people, the world will start believing not only that they have to pay for adaptation, but that we actually collectively can be successful. To us, that is very important. And that's why we want to tell you about how we do this for avalanches. And Doug will pick that up from now. I'm going to talk a little bit about the problem. Uh, first off, thank you on for explaining all that. Um, and so when we look at what exactly the problem, uh, this is who we're worried about. We're worried about the people in this picture. These are the people that live in these mountain communities. They are the ones that are threatened by large avalanches. And like Anno said, unlike recreationists like skiers and snowmobilers, they rarely trigger the slides that kill them. They're truly victims. Um, we worry about big avalanches with our program. Big avalanches, they run full track. They come to the top of the mountain all 
all the way down to the bottom. We call them climax avalanches, um, and they kill a lot of people. Now, we Aka works in really difficult areas. Um, this is a picture of Kabul. Uh, Afghanistan is a great example of this. Um, the country is at war at decades, and the war was just one of the many hardships uh, that these mountain communities are facing. So we want to break down the problem. Uh, some of these areas are remote. They have really poor communication, no electricity. It actually feels like the end of the earth. This picture here is in the uh, Wakhan area of uh, this little finger of land that separates Tajikistan uh, from Pakistan. And this, this is an incident here in, that happened in March 12th, uh, when 22 people died in a village in remote northern Afghanistan. Uh, and so it was incredibly tragic, and we're going to talk about that for a second. So the Wakhan is a stark landscape. There's 6,000 meter peaks surrounding it. And a lot of them tower 2,000 meters above the valley floor. Now, avalanches have hit this village before. And people will ask, you know, well, why haven't they moved? Well, it's complicated um, because Allah wills it. These are also ancestral lands. Uh, this is great spots for grazing. And they're all, you know, it, it just all makes moving incredibly difficult. Now, this avalanche happened at night and so everyone was in their homes sleeping um, and it was a big snowstorm and the snowstorm turned to rain uh, and the rain is what triggered the avalanche and rain falling on snow is incredibly dangerous and is also responsible for a lot of large avalanches when the avalanche came down it ran full track and destroyed many homes Here's a picture of the villagers digging out a home. And they're faced with just devastating loss. I mean, they've lost absolutely everything, including family members. Um, this is a picture of a, a home where the front door um, is actually chock full of avalanche debris and it killed everyone in the house. And their livestock was decimated. And what's important to know here is that livestock in these uh, rural mountain communities is where their wealth resides. You know, they don't have savings accounts, banks, stocks, you know, all their wealth is in their animals. And so when our herd, when their herd gets decimated, these villages, they lose their life savings. It's the equivalent of a, of a massive stock market crash. And this is the graves of the deceased. Um, and they're dug in the frozen earth in the middle of winter. Um, just incredibly tragic. So how do we prevent deaths? Well, the first thing we do is we predict um, a rising avalanche danger. And that's what I do. That's what I'm hired for is I help them predict when that avalanche danger is rising. Um, the second thing we do is we warn people. And we warn them via um, a cell phones, sat at phones, uh, radios called VSATs, um, and also Jamahanas also uh, give warnings out. And then we, third, we train them. And we give some avalanche education and we teach them when the danger is rising, what causes avalanches, and what to do if it happens. And then the last thing is we evacuate. We use predefined, pre identified safe areas in the village and we move people uh, down. Valley, if we need to. And so this this solution is simple, and it has to save lives. So what we came up with, you know, it's it has to be simple to understand, has to be simple to implement at a local level. It has to make sense. It has to be cost effective, um, and it has to be sustainable. And even more importantly, it has to work for an uneducated, often illiterate. Uh, population. And so what we're doing here is we first map the avalanche train, we teach some education, we identify some weather alert thresholds, and then we use an avalanche expert to give some advice, uh, watch the weather closely, and we plan on evacuations if needed. And we also have certain rescue teams in case things are going really wrong. 
So ACA created these hazard vulnerability risk assessment, assessment maps for every single village they work in. Now, they work out of 2,400 villages, 615 of these are at risk of avalanches. That's a lot, it's a lot of villages. It represents these 615 villages represent 46,400 residents living in under the threat of avalanches. And 40% of them are a vulnerable population. And what we mean by vulnerable is children below 12 years old, senior citizens over 60, uh, anyone disabled and widows. So the second thing we do is we give them some basic avalanche education. They're learning foundational avalanche awareness about why avalanches occur, how to become unstable, and what to do when dangerous conditions arise. We're going to show a quick video here um, from Tajikistan. And this is from the field. Masha <laughs> Kutajizot with his ocean sat the Borhata Katefuchiza Mohizant. Aro Arab Taishi Chis Sasuit, Master with Borhot Tindak River, Savam Tafot with Chis that Bohara's death, Marsha in the Yas Nelje Marshal Antena Yam. Thank you. Um, the third thing we do with our weather stations is uh, we have specific alert thresholds that we teach the villagers about. And we tell them and teach them to be alert for these because they're signs that the avalanche danger is rising. And so with climate change, we're seeing more rain falling on snow, um, especially at lower elevations, because we said before, rain is a trigger for big avalanches. And so that is why climate change is such an important thing for us. Um, the avalanche triangle is the same all over the world. People are in the center of it and villagers are the victims. We have terrain, um, which is a constant. Um, it does not change and it's been mapped by HVRA. Um, we have weather um, and we collect rel relevant weather data through these weather monitoring posts, these 89 posts. Um, and then the snowpack arm here is, is limited, but 
recent avalanche activity definitely gives us a sense as to what's happening in the snowpack. Now with a terrain identified avalanche activity getting reported and looking at daily weather, I can do rudimentary weekly forecasts. And so I look every morning and I talk to ACA staff um, and I help them make decisions. I put out this weekly bulletin, which is an avalanche and weather forecast, and it's updated frequently when it is storming out. And I do this all from Bozeman, Montana in the United States, which is where I am right now. Because um, for forecasting, remote work is effective the only because we are interested in the biggest avalanches that are hitting these villages in the valley bottom. So in the past, you know, it would snow in the valleys, it would snow in the cities, and we'd wonder, well, how much did it snow in the mountains? Um, you know, so if it snowed five centimeters in the valley, we might think like, oh, maybe there's 30 centimeters up high. Um, but the answer is we needed weather stations in the mountains. We needed real measurements, not just guesses. Um, and we started to think, well, couldn't we just give a guy a ruler and a thermometer and kind of call it good? And the answer is yes, we could do that. Um, you know, for about $100 each weather station, we can establish a weather monitoring post. Um, we put them in villages at the valley bottom. Um, it's the best we can do. Um, these instruments are maximum thermometers, a 24-hour storm board, a seasonal snow stake, handheld anemometer, um, and a rain gauge. Each of these stations are fenced in to keep out children, goats, cows. Um, it just keeps it nice and nice and neat in there. And today we have 89 weather monitoring posts, which are managed by 150 trained men and women. Uh, they're all volunteers. They're all community volunteers taking these daily measurements. We're gonna watch a video here um, from NERS Afghanistan. NERS is where the avalanche occurred uh, that killed 22 people that I talked about earlier. ولایت <laughs> Okay, um, I wasn't seeing myself on the screen, so I wasn't sure if we were ready, but uh, yep, so 
First off, thank you for uh, showing that video because that was impressive. Uh, NERS is a very, very remote village. Um, so these weather monitoring posts are placed in the most vulnerable uh, spots, you know, most vulnerable villages. Um, I'm having some technical difficulties because I cannot see the slides to see what slide we're on on my screen. There we go. Okay, thank you. Okay, these villages um, that we put these weather monitoring posts in have been repeatedly hit by avalanches. Uh, sometimes these avalanches are so big that they come down the other side of the river. They cross the river, climb up the hill on the other side and destroy communities on the opposite banks. And we train people in the community. They live there to take these daily weather observations. Now, behind these men is a village, and we make these weather monitoring post measurements uh, in the village behind them, and they're good. But in the mountains, what we'd like to do is learn about how much snow is up high where the avalanche actually starts. Um, so we needed a way to measure snow depth in the starting zones, like high up on the mountains so we created the snow mass which is what they are holding right here and each color represents a meter depth so as the snow piles up and it covers one of the colors um, we can guess or we can make an estimate as to how much snow is on the ground and this can be seen from the valley below and so with a spotting scope a villager can see the snow mass and get an estimate of the snow depth now when i was explaining this uh, in Tajikistan, uh, through an interpreter, um, that you, you know, I was explaining, hey, you know, when the weather's clear, you know, get your spotting scope, look up at the snow mast, and, uh, you know, and if there's no visibility, like, don't worry about it. Like, just, you know, get it when the weather's clear. And this guy said, he goes, no, sir, sir. He says, if it's, if it's cloudy, um, I will go up there. I, I, if you if I cannot see from the valley, I will walk up there and I will tell you how much snow is on that stake. And I said, no, 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 you cannot do that. Um, you're going to die in an avalanche if you do that. These things are really high. Um, and so I made sure that the translator conveyed to him how that would not be a really good idea. Now, each thumbtack in this map represents one of our 89 weather monitoring posts, basically 89 people with rulers, and they report every single day to Aka about what they're finding. They give us weather data 95 to 100% of the time. I mean, it's incredibly reliable. Now, in vulnerable villages, we identify safe areas that they can they can evacuate to. Aka has also trained personnel to help in evacuation and rescue people if needed. Now, next, Shodman, he's the global head of emergency management for all of Aka. He's going to explain how this is implemented. Thank you very much, Doug, and good afternoon to everybody. The the seventh point that uh, we are highlighting here. It, it's primarily talking about our vol volunteers, search and rescue teams, and uh, uh, the, the slide which you see there is primarily showing our advanced search and rescue teams, which we have 160 of our target areas. So the question pops how we are selecting our volunteers, and uh, the details are on the slide. You can see it from there that primarily they are all coming, they are joining the teams voluntarily. Nobody is forced. The process is done in a very selective manner. We are talking to the village heads. People should not have bad background. They should be cleaned, yes. Uh, they should have a good track record, good behavior in the village. And we are selecting them from various uh, backgrounds, health, uh, education, background, some people are young, some people are elder age because of respect and etc. And uh, people have to respect the country law. People have code of conduct and our teams are adhering to this. 
And uh, as Doug was also mentioning, you could see that we have a very large number of villages that our volunteers are dispersed across. And then a question pops up, how we are keeping in touch with our volunteers? And uh, there's a small video which shows how we are connecting with our villages. The video, please. حبيب بالبوري هاس جاي من قناه درس وجود نظره رقم بعد ما نشوف ازاي عم راس ورقم دیگه <laughs> Thank you very much, the team. So, so you saw this video clip is coming from Afghanistan, one of the very remote villages. So we are using emergency communications to get in touch with these villages. We still have many villages in our target areas which are deprived. There are political issues like in Afghanistan. You cannot install emergency communications because the government is not allowing it. But we are still trying our best to get it to our villages. And the next question which pops up, does all this thing that Doug and I were talking about, does it really work? And if we go to the charts that you can see, the two graphs which are on the slides, if you can look at them, you can see that uh, in the first chart at the left upper part, it tells us that the number of avalanches is quite high in our target areas. It's more than 1,000 that we are recording over the years. And if you see the second chart, it tells that despite the number of avalanches increasing, which primarily is because of launching the program, because we have accurate data recording, the number of fatalities is decreasing because of uh, various interventions that we were talking about. And as you see, the ratio of event uh, fatalities to event is also decreasing in our core areas. If you pay attention to control areas, which is the chart below, though, this data is not uh, fully accurate, but this is the maximum data that we could collect from our neighboring areas where we are not having the program. It shows that despite lesser number of avalanches, the fatality ratio is quite high there. And uh, another question which pops up, yes, why? Why it is working? Why avalanche? are happening, more avalanches are happening in our target areas, there are less fatalities. And what our experience is primarily telling, like there are two primary reasons. The first reason is that we have, we are following first approach. Like uh, anything we are doing in our target areas, we do it, the first thing, it is government partnership. Whether it is Tajikistan, whether it is Pakistan, whether it was somewhere else, we are always talking to government authorities. We are getting permissions. We have Colonel uh, Aronshaw here. 
We are constantly partnering with the Committee of Emergency Situation and Civil Defense with National Disaster Management Authorities. And the second thing is uh, that we have regular presence. Our co community, they are coming from the same villages. They are not coming from outside. So they are always there. And uh, the third thing is that uh, our approach is programmatic. We don't do a small scale project and leave the areas. As you saw it, we are present since 2017 and are working. And uh, the, the last point uh, is, which really makes this model work, there is trust and commitment. So the, the work of volunteers is highly appreciated. People give lots of respect to them. We had an incident in 2017-2018 winter in Afghanistan. Uh, some family members, they didn't want to leave the areas. Then the volunteers came with elder age uh, people. Then some government authorities were also involved. They came to the village. They requested the family members. They left. And then the next day, nine houses were wiped out by the avalanches. But one thing which is worth mentioning, yes, it is working. It is giving very good results. But we also have areas where we need to improve in future. And with that, I'm just handing over to Ono, who talks about next steps. So it works. Um, but the risk is getting worse. Avalanches will be more. Um, no no matter what happens at this conference, avalanches will be more in coming years. So what are we going to take this program to? First, we're going to be more ambitious about understanding long-term risks so that we can see whether it's actually possible to keep working with these communities and keep their habitat safe, because that's our target. We're mapping these same areas 30 years from now, 50 years from now, to understand the long-term climate risks. We um, also want to bring to these mountains what is already available above Aspen, Davos, uh, Chamonix and uh, other areas where you might want to go skiing. The ability to understand the details of the weather so that people who are not going to the mountains for fun but actually live there are as safe as those people who pay lots of money to go to the mountains for fun. For that we need to make sure that technologies that exist in Switzerland and other areas are made more robust and cheaper. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're working on automated water, weather stations. We're working on snowpack modeling. We're working on mitigation structures. Anybody who's ever been to the mountains, what these things look like? You think they're simple. They're very expensive, actually. But we work with our teams to make them cheaper because they're highly effective to actually stop avalanches in their track. Because our goal is to make sure that it is as safe to live in the villages that you saw in the videos as it is to go skiing in Aspen. And I love Aspen. I've got nothing against people who are skiing. I just think it is so important to protect these habitats, and all of us think that. So what lessons do we want you to take home? First of all, if you invest in local capacity, you're more likely to be successful. That is well known, but I think the approach, the building of trust in the community, the sustainability, and really sticking with it long term is very effective. The second thing is building global and local expertise together. We didn't want Doug to come because we wanted to show that he does his work from Montana, which is much cheaper. So he's disappointed. He doesn't get to go to the beach in Sharm El Sheikh. But on a daily basis, he sits at home drinking his coffee, predicting avalanches in northern Afghanistan. It's just unimaginable, but it works. The third thing is partner with government. You cannot do this work if the government doesn't allow you because the government actually has the primary responsibility for the safety of its citizens. So we must work with governments and not just be as an NGO on our own. It cannot work. And the last thing is, if the problem is too difficult, like I said, the technology in Switzerland is too expensive, you just work until you figure out how to make it cheaper. We work in a part of the world where engineering can be made very cheaply, where excellent science is available. Of the 1,000 staff of our agency, 950 are from the areas we work from, if not more. And that's how we like to keep it. That's why our global of the of emergency management, Shortmon, is from a village in the Pamirs in, uh, in Tajikistan. His predecessor, Nusrat, is from Upper Hunza in Pakistan because you need to combine cutting-edge knowledge with local knowledge. 
because, ladies and gentlemen, simple solutions are actually effective, and I think we can outrun climate change. Один из опытов, который показал себя в сторонах, это задействование волонтерской инициативы во всех спектрах стихийных бедствий. Волонтеры, которые были созданы посредством ХК и Комитета по чрезвычайным ситуациям, это очень организованная и славная команда, которая реагирует на всякие стихийные бедствия, и тем самым облегчает нам работу. Второй фактор – это еще весомый выклад о системе мониторинга и ранового оповещения, который их присутствие и установки очень важны в нашей стране, потому что мы можем вовремя определить, ту или иную угрозу и, соответственно, будем принимать э, меры соответствующие. One of the experiences that proved to be comprehensive is the involvement of the volunteer initiative in all spectrum of natural disasters. Volunteers are very organized and well coordinated system uh, that respond to different disasters that are happening in, in the country. And uh, the volunteers at the same time uh, do the very good job and at the same time they, they, they uh, and at the same time they, uh, they make our work easy and the second factum that uh, that is uh, there is the installment of the of the monitoring systems that we have in Tajikistan the early warning system uh, the early warning system that we call EWS uh, installed on Saris Lake and this uh, EWS proved to be very excellent and uh, giving a very good result uh, for, for, the, for the country. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I'll please have a seat. I'll come for, for now to Afghan Raza. Afghan, uh, can you hear us? Do we have Afghan? Afghan, um, could you just share with us, because you're one of the volunteers who's, who's working on assessing um, climate and, and natural hazards. From your perspective, what, why do you... 
Yes. From your perspective, why is it important, the work that you do on the weather monitoring, the climate monitoring, and what are the benefits and challenges? And please unmute before you speak, because you're currently muted. Afghan, please unmute. Press the microphone symbol. Why don't we go to Dilsha Begum first and then we you can maybe message Afghan to unmute and we'll ask him the question. Dilsha Begum can go there. So Dilsha Begum was a volunteer for a very long time. And um, you know, the main task of a volunteer is to get people to evacuate when there's a reason to do so. Now, in the West, we know this is very difficult. Um, we very often hear that there's a storm coming, people need to evacuate, but then people don't evacuate. As you can see from the statistics, our volunteers manage to get volunteers to evacuate. Dersa Bikum, can you speak about how that works and why that works and give an example? Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Ru. So, uh, our community in Pamirs are having a very strong attitude towards to the volunteering perspective, and it is the work for the volunteering jointly with the government agencies who, uh, who do all the evacuation process and the village place where the risk of different disaster exists. And uh, many people do all the necessary involvement except in doing the volunteers' work not to be hard and complete it. And whatever the volunteers say, they immediately act and perform all the rescues. Uh, coming uh, from the volunteering, uh, coming from a uh, volunteer side, I can tell you the example from Barsem village. It is in Tajikistan. Uh, the Barsem village where the mud flow vanished, a very big village. And 82 houses have been destroyed. Uh, people have been displayed uh, only uh, because of the volunteers, there was no loss of human, uh, of human lives. Okay. Thank you, Dersha Begum. Uh, is Afghan now on? No. Not working. Um, okay, in, in that case, let's first go back to the Colonel. Colonel, um, if somebody from another government came to you and said we would like to know how we can solve this problem in our country we would like to warn people so that they can survive avalanches and live a better life despite this risk what would be your advice to a government official what would you advise them to do какими передовыми методами и уроками вы могли бы поделиться с другими партнерскими странами которые задали бы вам вопрос, как мы можем и как разумно можно подходить к разным проблемным ситуациям в таких сферах. Аналогичный подход к адаптации на уровне сообщества. Своевременная подготовка к разным стихийным бедствиям, это всегда приводит к успеху и тем самым минимизирует потери, в том числе людские потери. В наши дни показали себя очень эффективно это с темой мониторинга и ранового оповещения. Это волонтеры, которые иногда даже приходят на помощь первыми, чем другие структурные подразделения и неправительственные организации, потому что они живут на тех местах, где именно, именно приходят а, стихийные бедствия, и, естественно, они приходят а, первые на помощь. А, имеют а, контейнеры с запасами первой необходимости. А, а, нуж, нужно создавать временные лагеря для лиц пострадавших от стихийных бедствий. А, вот таким образом можно своевременно реагировать на разные стихийные бедствия. Uh, in today's reality that we 
in today's reality that we see, uh, there are so many aspects uh, that that can be very uh, that very good to 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 uh, to tell to our partner organizations, to partner uh, countries, for for saying that uh, uh, for being uh, successful, it is very nice. Uh, uh, firstly, to install in uh, the hazard places the uh, the double uh, the early warning system the volunteering teams to establish volunteering teams uh, to install the uh, the stockpiles uh, that are very necessary in different in, in different villagers uh, and uh, this is a very uh, uh, this is a very uh, uh, productive and very important aspect that 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 have to be installed in the village places uh, for different disaster aspects and these are uh, my advice for the countries in order to be prepared for the for the different disasters to install all those uh, pre perspectives that can be used in those disaster uh, uh, moments thank, thank you very much colonel the advice of the government is essentially to start volunteerism now i'd like to hear from dilshit begum if you had to advise another country where to start building a system what would your advice be okay I can advise for other organizations, for other communities to support as much the volunteer perspective. Because the volunteers are the community people and only these people can provide their support at disaster time uh, on the very timely basis. And as we can uh, see, their early preparedness with the volunteering team can be much effective than, uh, than without them. Yes. Thank, thank you very much. Hello. I just wanted to check whether Afghan is uh, now has sound. Yes. yes? No. Very good. Yeah. So uh, Afghan, oh. um, very sorry it didn't work earlier, but we mm -hmm. would like you to tell us about your experience as a weather monitoring volunteer. Why do you think is important? This is important, and how hard is it, or how easy is it? What do you think about it? It seems very tough to me. Uh, first of all, I am very thankful for me such a beautiful 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 here we have hot weather. We are directly affected with climate change. These uh, climate change in the north as northern, and these are directly affected with us. So uh, we have a uh, different uh, around the number of weather monitoring modes to run. We work in different regions. We are uh, getting information today. We are providing information to our guard members, to our staff members, to so different things. Uh, they are getting the updated, so uh, lots of groups uh, are deciding, those officials who are deciding to run, they are providing information to us, so they can get this information to our communities, our industry uh, members, our staff members, and our community politics. Uh, so they are uh, so the part of this information to the community. <clears throat> there are some challenges as well to us when providing this information to the community. The first one is very, very communication program. Yes, sometimes that we are unable to communities as well with the launch these disasters in a certain area. Our infrastructure is broken. So we are running for the information to the proper time. But due to our volunteer team, in very specific area, they can get our messages there. They can only be in that area and they get information they are updated to us for different times. These are some of the challenges we are facing by the company information to them. Basically, uh, we have been working on different types of different things for seminars or training. So 
these are the these platforms are giving our communities the loans, the taxes, these are some of the things from which our communities are taking the Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Afghan. So, um, I, for the people in the room and those online, I see that there are some in the chat. If there's any questions online, we could answer them. If anybody in the room would like to answer a question, there is a microphone that could be used. And you could ask a question to, to the Colonel, to our volunteers, to Shortmon, to Doug. Um, please, can you check the, the chat? Because we can't see it. Please, sir, you switch it on. Hello, thank you very much. My name is Mohib Lojulev. I am a representative of Committee for Environmental Protection. Uh, thank you for your uh, clear presentation. I have following question. Uh, as I know, uh, about 93% uh, of the Republic of Tajikistan occupied by mountains, and then 70% uh, of the population living in a rural mountainous area. So. Uh, maybe you explain in your presentation, uh, but uh, once again, how you how you will identify the risk zone in the mountains? Could you please uh, explain it briefly? So, so, so can you explain how? Thank you very much. I think that is a very great question. So what Doug was talking about uh, is uh, what we are calling hazard vulnerability risk assessment. In Tajikistan, we have a methodology, HVRA, Hazard Vulnerability Risk Assessment Methodology, which I myself was working uh, in this field. And that time, uh, Rais Jumazoda Murad Khol and his team at the Department of Geology under the president of Tajikistan. So the methodology was reviewed and hundreds have been assessed using the methodology which comprises of set of indicators that are used to identify the risk level of various villages. So using this uh, methodology, what the agency does together with its government partners, whether it is in Tajikistan, Pakistan and Afghanistan, the villages get classified. Some of them are green, some of them are yellow, which means there is a moderate risk level and some of them are red. So this is how we are classifying the risk. Thank you very much for your great question. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shubman. Um, so, so with that, we, um, we understand there's no questions in the chat. So with that, we'd like to really thank you, everybody online. We will keep working to make sure that people on the front lines of climate change are safe, no matter what the results of the climate change negotiations are. But we'd be really grateful to the climate change negotiators to help us in our work by not dropping one and a half degrees. Thank you very much.